Okay, so we'll uh, continue with our discussion on the various components of the Earth system. If you recall, this is chapter 2. For the sake of continuity, I'll just quickly run through some of the slides which you already saw in the previous class. So the permafrost is one important component. Uh, permafrost is permanent, it's permanent frost, frost embedded in soils for more than 2 years. So this happens in uh, places like Siberia. It affects the ecology and human activities in Siberia, Alaska, Northern Canada. So we were talking about the climate change because of the climate change, this thawing and melting of this permafrost in Siberia. So it's about few meters to 1500 meters depth in Siberia. So if a global temperature rise of more than 1.5 degrees centigrade takes place, which is not far off, then uh, thawing of the Siberian permafrost takes place. So this is basically a view graph which tells you the temperature versus depth, right? So you can see that uh, the summer temperature is on the right side, uh, the winter temperature is on the lower side and the average is something like this. So the average has to be less than 0 degrees centigrade for it to remain as frost. So you can see that there is some, the permafrost, we have uh, depicted it up to 50 meters, right, depth. The terrestrial biosphere was the last component which we saw in the last class, we, were, we went through these slides very fast. So actually the most important thing, it controls and regulates the temperature, vegetation always controls both temperature and precipitation. So you can see for example, uh, in Kerala you, you get more rain, okay, basically because the monsoon hits there first and so on. And also if it is more green, for example, IIT we have a temperature drop of 1 to 2 degrees centigrade when you enter the campus from outside, that is because, because of the thick vegetation. There is also an important process which is basically the evapotranspiration which takes place in the, in the plants and also this vegetation maintains a particular kind of reflectivity, right. So as you can very well imagine, the reflectivity from a tropical rainforest is quite different from a reflectivity from a just barren desert in Saudi Arabia for example, right. So this has ramifications in uh, basically uh, outgoing long wave radiation, incoming radiation, the amount of radiation which is captured, the reflectivity and all this radiation balance. And also this uh, vegetation can alter the roughness of the surface, the roughness will alter the wind speeds, correct. And then the impact of climate upon animals and humans and uh, in regulating because of the, the terrestrial biosphere. We are also there, animals are also there. So the impact of all this animal life on uh, regulating the condition and distribution of forest, uh, forestation, deforestation, all these things, okay, forest fires, natural, uh, naturally induced forest fires, man induced forest fires, all these things have a big role to play in deciding the climate of the earth. So the terrestrial birds, this is a good uh, conceptual framework for understanding how the a particular type of plant vegetation with various parts of the globe, how it depends or how they depend on annual mean temperature and precipitation. So on the ordinate is uh, rainfall and on the abscess is the mean temperature. So you can see that uh, as the temperature increases for regardless of the type of vegetation, as the temperature increases, the amount of rainfall which is required increases, right. And uh, obviously the temperature is going to be very high in the desert region and tundra, tundra region, the uh, temperature is low and so on. So you can move from left to right and understand how things vary. You can also move from bottom to top. We have already discussed this in the previous class. So to summarize that view, view graph, forests require more water than grasslands, grasslands require more water than desert and for uh, within a particular vegetation, the vegetation, the water demands of any specific particular type of vegetation increases with temperature, okay. So the last part basically which we are going to look at in today's class is basically the earth's crust and mantle often not studied because it is considered as geology or geophysics and so on, but this is also a major role to play. One of the most important things uh, I'll, to break the suspense is the earth's crust and mantle have a big role to play in the way the continents have been shaped. The way the continents have been shaped also, res, also res, uh, is responsible for the way there are ocean currents, climatic regions, which regions uh, prospered first, where did civilization start first, why, did, uh, why was steam engine figured out in Europe and all that because the life started in Europe first and all that. It is not that some race is particularly too over smart compared to others and so on. Near the Euphrates river, actually Iraq, if you, guns, germs and steel, have you 
there is a book called Guns, Germs and Steel. Okay. So, so this uh, earth's crust and mantle have a major role to play in deciding the shape of the continents. Okay. Otherwise, there is something called an aqua planet. When you do simulations, what we do is in atmospheric scientists when they do simulations, we can do simulations on what is called an aqua planet. An aqua planet is a simulation where it is 100 percent water. Okay. So, in order to get quick estimates, we also look at this aqua planet simulations. Funda is it is not an aqua planet, only 72 per, it is only 72 percent aqua planet, 28 percent is still okay, land. Now, let us get into this. The current configuration of the various continents, oceans and mountain ranges is basically a consequence of what is called plate tectonics okay, and continental drift. The plate tectonics is actually a theory. Okay. It is now believed that it is correct, but no theory is so sacrosanct that it cannot be challenged. The, the goal of human creativity, enterprise and knowledge is to basically challenge any theory. Okay, the hydrodynamic theory was challenged by Prandtl and Prandtl's boundary layer theory is now considered to be the theory. It, it is not the be all and end all of fluid mechanics. There could be a new theory which could explain things better as of now, as of now E is equal to H nu, as of now E is equal to M c squared. Okay. As of now, uh, boundary layer theory delta by x is much, much less than 1. There is something called the slenderness of the boundary layer theory with which you can, with, with which you can simplify the governing Navier-Stokes equation and create and make them into boundary layer equations which will transform the elliptic equations into a parabolic differential equations which lend itself amenable to mathematical analysis through a similarity transformation which leads to the Blaisier solution. So, it is a 2 minute course on fluid mechanics. Okay. We can also use the integral method. Now, you have got the powerful finite volume, finite element uh, and finite difference method to solve all this. Let us get back to this. The earth's crust and mantle, they also take part in the chemical transformation because there can be some something which is at the bottom of the ocean through some volcanic eruptions. All these chemicals can be lifted all the way from the bottom to the atmosphere. Okay. So, there is a direct route. There is a direct route from deep inside the mantle to the atmosphere. So, they also take part in the chemical transform, transformation. This can lead to changes in the um, carbon, carbon budgeting as well as the oxygen budgeting. Carbon budgeting means automatically carbon dioxide so in the atmosphere. So, that mediates the composition of the atmosphere on time scales of, but the time scales is not seconds or days or weeks. It is of tens to hundreds of millions of years. It is a very slow process. Okay. So, the mantle temperature ranges from 500 to 900 degrees centigrade inside the earth's surface uh, at the upper boundary with the crust temperature, the crust temperature can be over 4000 degrees centigrade. So, this is a special blend. So, this if you are interested in doing this, you are going to study as you are interested in a subject called mantle convection, okay, which comes under geophysics or geology or okay. mantle convection is same the equations fluid mechanics and heat transfer equations will come, but scales will be very different temperatures also will be very different. So, your business approximation and all that we do not know whether they will be valid or not. Okay. That is Alfred Wegener. So, 1880 to 1930, lived for 50 years, a German. Okay. So, he figured out this theory, he proposed this theory of plate tectonics. What is plate tectonics? Plate tectonics is a theory that explains how the earth's continents float slowly on the surface, changing both their position, it should be earth's continents changing both their position and size over time. Okay. The shape and size of continents. So, they are saying that uh, they are, uh, everything is floating, that is what he is saying. Okay. Everything is floating on the mantle. Okay. He proposed the theory in 1920, but as usual people did not accept this theory for a long time. Okay. So, it took about 30, 40 years. So, it was uh, the geological community accepted this theory only in the 60s. So, this acceptance of this theory is less than 50, is around 50 years old. What does this theory say? According to this theory, the earth's crust also known as the lithosphere is broken up into approximately around 10 plates. There are some 10 plates. These plates are actually floating. It is scary to hear this, but uh, hear about this, but this is the truth. They are actually floating on the earth's mantle, okay, on the earth's upper mantle. Mantle is a partially molten layer consisting of various chemicals, liquids and all that. So, these pl plates are floating on this. So, the major geological activity takes place at the interface of these various plates. At the interface of these various plates, plates can approach each other, okay. then plates can move away from each other, 
there could be some shear between this. Because of this, lot of geological activities are taking place. What kind of geological activities? And the earthquakes, this thing and all that, which we will see, there will be some fault lines and all that, right. Seismologists work on this. So, wherein one plate tries to push into another, they pull further apart or move sideways with tremendous power. When these things are taking place, some action results. What is this action? At these rims, where these actions take place, there are earthquakes, mountain building and or volcanic activities, okay. This is a theory which he proposed. Under the sea, where the earth crust is relatively thin, okay, under the sea, because already a lot of depth is covered by the water, the earth crust is relatively thin but dense, the plates are moving away from one another, the new crust is formed at the spreading edges, as the lava flows, I will show you, it will become more clear with the picture, as the lava flows from the upper mantle. So, this process is actually called the sea floor spreading and increases the size of the plates, okay. So, I will give this presentation, there is no need to copy this. So, there is an oceanic plate, so I explained this concept. So, there is a mantle, so there is a mantle convection which is taking place. So, this is the ocean, so here you have an oceanic plate and there is a sea floor sp spreading and there is a subduction where this plate is just sucked, it goes into this, okay. When the rims of the thin undersea tectonic plates come towards one another, one edge goes under the another, other, one edge goes under the other. This is called subduction, where the plate gets smaller. Plates that lie above the region of upwelling in the upwelling, upwelling is the region where from the mantle that convection something is going up, they are spreading. So, somewhere it is spreading, somewhere it is sub, subducting and so on. So, whereas plates that lie above the region of downwelling are being pushed together, so which means in slowly but surely, the shape and size of the continents is changing. Some ge geological activity is taking place below, right. So, earthquakes tend to be concentrated along the plate boundaries. Wherever there are, there is an interface between the various plates, you can actually see that the fault lines and the earthquakes are taking place along this. You must have, somebody must have taught you this before, right. So, this is a picture where the left side, it says there is a shear between the two plates. Here, the two plates are moving apart here the two plates are moving towards each other. So, you can see hot spots, lithosphere, so this is just an overview, right. So, there is something called convergent plate boundary, divergent plate boundary, let us not get into all these details because our goal is to study atmosphere, okay, this is just to, just to give an overview, all right. I will give you this picture, okay. What is a now summing up the role of various components of the earth system? What I want to say is the atmosphere is indeed the most important. Okay, the atmosphere is very important in deciding the earth's climate, but the atmosphere is not the only thing in deciding the earth's climate. That is what we understood by studying, by studying this chapter 2, where we looked at all the other players, right. So, let us summarize. Atmospheric processes play a crucial role in the, not deposition, okay. In the disposition of incoming solar radiation the disposition of the temp temperature of the earth's surface, the spatial distribution of water in the atmosphere, in the terrestrial biosphere and the distribution of nutrients in the euphotic zone. So, no doubt all these things are controlled by the atmosphere, but apart from that there are other things. What are these other things? The role of other component is also influential. For example, the large storage of heat in the ocean mixed layer and the cryosphere regulates the extremes in the weather, okay. It extremes the fluctuations during winter and summer because there is so much of MCP delta T, there is a thermal inertia associated with this, all right. Widespread vegetation brings down the summer temperatures to less than 40 degrees in the continents, otherwise the summer temperature would have been much higher, all right. Point number 3. The oceanic thermohaline circulation which is occurring because of differences in temperature and salinity, that is why it is called thermohaline convection if you recall. So, the oceanic thermohaline circulation, it warms actually the Ar Arctic region and the coastal zone of Europe by several degrees, that is why Europe is very, very, has a very, very habitable climate. Otherwise, for 50 degrees, London, uh, Hamburg, all these places have, should have been minus 40, minus 50, highly unlivable. So, the ocean currents are making a, are making, are having a big role in making Europe so habitable, right. That is why a lot of population is concentrated in Europe. Europe is a, the continent developed first, much before that, okay. Now, 
plate tectonics which we discussed in today's class has shaped the current configuration of continents and topography and somehow most of the continents are in the northern hemisphere, we do not know why most of the continents are in the northern hemisphere and northern hemisphere appears to be more developed. You can see that northern, I showed in one of the pictures also right, northern hemisphere is more developed. If you look at the GDP of northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, there will be vast disparity. The only decent countries in the southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, probably Brazil now, South Africa, okay, most of them, okay. So, if you see now southern hemisphere, we do not, Singapore and all is still 0 degrees, right, Singapore is still equator. So, south we do not have many countries which are economically advanced. Okay, so, plate tectonics has shaped the current configuration of continents and their topography, which in turn shapes many of the distinctive regional features of today's climate. Okay. Finally, through the earth's crust and mantle, because of this continent, because of this plate tectonics and all these plates coming together, moving apart and all that and this mantle convection and all that, there is a recycling of minerals through the upper earth's upper mantle. And this is this uh, this is believed to have played a major role in the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which exerts strong influences upon the Earth's surface tem temperature. In in fact, the original Big Bang theory, originally when Earth was formed, there was no oxygen. We'll see that now. We'll have to find out what is the source of oxygen in the Earth. If you do in one of the subsequent classes, we'll try to do an analysis and try to see what has what has resulted in the production of oxygen in Earth. Okay, but uh, the oxygen has built up over a period of time. All right. Now, uh, if you look at the Earth system, E must be capital. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, the various components: the oceans, the cryosphere, the terrestrial biosphere, the Earth's crust and mantle, which I've indicated in grey color, we've already considered so far. And now, if you recall, this was the first slide in the second chapter. Part one was the components. Part 2 is hydrological cycle, part 3 is carbon cycle and part 4 is oxygen in the earth system. We need to study each of this. After we complete all the 4 parts, I promise that we will get into atmospheric thermodynamics. So, part 1 is now over. Now, we will have to go to part 2 where we look at the hydrological cycle. Any doubt so far? Okay. The cycling of water, hydrological cycle refers to the cycling of water. Okay, hydrological cycle, cycling of water. It is critical to the sustenance of life on earth because water can exist as water vapor, water can exist as ice, water can exist as liquid water itself. So, it is critical to the sustenance of life on earth, there is no doubt about it. Okay. This is, uh, this picture is coming from your geography school days, right. Now, let us look at it a little more carefully. So, this is the hydrological cycle. So, where do we start? Okay. From the ocean. From the ocean, there is evaporation, then clouds, condensation and it may not condense at the same place, by winds it may be transported. So, this is called advection, right. So, there can be horizontal transport. It may rain elsewhere and we are very happy if it rains on the land, <laughs> okay. So, if it keeps on raining on the ocean, it is of no use to us. So, it rains and who brings these clouds to the, who brings these clouds to the land? Winds, okay which are the most important winds who, which are bringing the clouds to the land as far as India is concerned? Northwest monsoon. Southwest monsoon. It is also called, it is mausam actually, it is a modification of the word mausam. The southwest monsoon are also called as the Indian monsoon or the Indian summer monsoon, which cause heavy rain in JGAS, June, July, August, September. Okay. So, we call JGAS rain. Now, we are in A, next uh, S will come. After that, it will stop, then the winds will reverse, that is called the retreating monsoon, then the direction will reverse and you will get winds from northeast, from the cold Himalayas it will, and then because of the Coriolis component of the earth's rotation, it will, be, it will basically take a turn. That is why all the cyclones heading towards Madras will then go to Andhra Pradesh or it may go to Urissa and finally, it may hit Bangladesh also. Have you seen that? They, that is called re recurving, that recurving can also take place, okay. So, winds are very, very important. Okay, why you right? Why you Bhagwan? That's what they say. They are very they are clouds have to come from the ocean. Okay, so that it lands, it rains on land. Then vegetation, evaporation and transpiration. Okay, then this evaporative transpiration again cause clouds condensation, advection. So this is there. Then this rain can come down. 
it can cause a stream flow and that rain, rain can directly go again into the ocean, okay? Or it can do infiltration and become ground water. It can be stored as ground water. Then you can also have snow and glacier, there is melting and then big rivers are formed like Himalaya and uh, Ganga and Yamuna and all that and then you can have this and then they go through the plains and finally they join the sea. So this is basically the hydrological cycle. So each of this can be characterized, you can have mathematical equations for each of this and then model this over a limited region or you can model it over a regional scale or you can model it over the whole earth scale. So this comes under the subject of hydrology, which is a big, which is a big subject in civil engineering, okay. Now please take down this figure, please take down this table. So this gives a, this gives a, this is a table which lists the major reservoirs of water in the earth and the mass into 10 to the power of minus 3 kilogram per meter cube. That means the mass is the value given in the table into 10 to the power of 3 kilogram per meter cube. Is it okay? So this is basically mass density per meter square of surface area. Whenever you want to find the actual mass, what do you do? Multiply by 4 pi Re square, where Re is 6370 kilometer or 6.37 into 10 to the power of 6 meters. This is a value which would, you should not forget in this course, okay. Atmosphere 0 0.01 into 10 to the power of 3 kilogram per meter cube. The residence time is only days. That is if you trace a particle, its life is only a day, few days. Then fresh water, lakes and rivers, mass into 10 to the power of minus 3 is 0 0.6. The residence time is days to years. Fresh water is 15. Alpine glaciers is 0.2, Greenland ice sheets, okay, ice sheets on Greenland is 5, Antarctic ice sheet is 53, the ocean is 2700 and the crust and mantle is 20,000, okay. But you see, what is the logic behind this table? How has this table been arranged? In the order of increasing, very good, it is arranged in the order of increasing residence time. Mantle, look at the mantle, the residence time is how much, okay. So what is residence time? The residence time is the mass of the reservoir divided by the F flux. F flux, you are copying there, or, okay. Then we will solve a problem now. Say, say that again. Then should the first time man also have some uh, No, no, that is okay. Ocean is basically sometimes it can drop immediately and how, how do we? Everything comes back to the ocean, no? That is why it is left intentionally blank, I think. Hmm? Okay. Now, what is the residence time in the table? The residence time is basically the mass of the reservoir divided by the efflux. Efflux is the rate at which substance is exiting from the reservoir. Okay. Say that again. No, this can. There are various estimates for that, right? So you can have some proxies based on some uh, analysis. Some uh, correct. There'll be an error, man. But uh, agreed upon by many people. This. Huh? 
So you can use some dating and this thing, how much time it has taken or some approximate uh, calculations. Just how do people say that uh, uh, Big Bang theory and all that, it is something like that. So some little bit of appro approximation will be there, but that uh, as you say it is correct, it can be 10 to the power of 11 or 2 into 10 to the power of 11 or 4 into 10 to the power of 11 or 5 into 10 to the power of 10, it is of that order, it is very huge. Hmm? Okay. So what we can do is, we, I do not know, for example, as far as climate is concerned, the satellites are available only for 40, 50 years. So if you look at the change in pattern, we can extrapolate by a few hundred years. But for 10 to the power of 11 years, what data they have used, we do not know. For uh, ice, what we can do is we can go into Siberia and go deep down and get the ice sample at various heights, various depths. Then you can correlate with the carbon dioxide and uh, for a particular depth, so the ice is continuously forming on it, you can actually get the time. That is how they do. So they, it, it is a mixture of science plus some, so we can say it is a guesstimate. Eh? Okay. Let us flesh out some terminology. The residence time is the mass of the reservoir divided by the efflux. Efflux is the rate at which substance exits from the reservoir. The key point, what you have to understand from this uh, previous table is the extremely short residence time of the atmosphere of the order of few days. Okay. Shall we move on to the next one? Okay. Based on the data given, please take down this problem. Problem number 7, is it? Okay, then we will 7. So, I will just pack it. I will not use the number. Okay. What happened? Okay, please take down problem number 7. Based on the data given in the preceding table, based on the data given in the preceding table, by how much will the sea level rise? Based on the data given in the preceding table, by how much will the sea level rise if the Greenland ice sheet completely melts? Okay. So, take a few minutes and Please start solving. So first, we will have to calculate the mass of the Greenland ice sheet, correct? That is the first step. It is always based on per meter square of the surface area. So you have to multiply it by 4 pi r e squared. Okay. It is kilogram per meter square of the earth's surface, total surface area of the earth. That is the way it is. The, these are the units used in atmospheric science. I told you in the first class itself. Then you are uh, tying yourself up in knots, isn't it? There should be a baseline for this thing. Then you will never be able to calculate that value, right? Then next you will ask me, sir, what is the uh, square uh, surface area of the Antarctic ice sheet? So this will go on, no? So, somewhere you have to <laughs> understand. Where is your house? My house is next to his house. Where is his house? His house is next to my house. I mean, you know <laughs> that problem cannot be solved. Okay. 
let us work it out slowly. So, mass of the Greenland ice sheet is what is the value given in the table? 5, huh? 5 into 10 to the power of plus 3. Because mass into 10 to the power of minus 3 kilogram per meter square is 5. Therefore, mass is 5 into 10 to the power of 3 into okay. So, this is the radius of the earth. Please do not forget this in this course. Okay. Yeah, substitute 6.3 to 10 to the power of 6. Tell me some huge number. 2.5 oh. kg or tons? Kg. Is it okay? Now, we have to find out how much the le level will rise. Uh, for that, you have to make an assumption. Density, okay, 1000 thousand, thousand kilogram per meter cube. Assumption number 1, density is 1000 kilogram per meter cube. Forget the 1025, that is okay. Then? Not two thirds, what is it? We have to make couple of assumptions. 72 percent of the earth's surface is only covered with oceans. Density of water is 1000 kilogram per meter, meter cube and when it melts, it will be uniformly distributed over this 72 percent, correct. Now, calculate the, keep the height by which it rises as x, pull out the x. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, what is it? Okay. Okay. I have to multiply by point seven two also. Okay, it doesn't matter. So too high, no? Some six point something. Uh, so what will happen with the whole? Greenland ice sheet melts 6.95 meters is like 22 feet, uh, 23 feet. It's very bad. Scary, isn't it? Uh, so you can find out if any of the other things melts, what happens. You can do the calculations for other things also, right? So X is 6. Point so it is, uh, it is dangerous, right? Simple analysis, we are able to say, but it won't melt day after tomorrow or tomorrow. Right? Don't worry about that. But if it melts, <laughs> then like that, any of those uh, any of those things which are remaining as ice, if they melt, that means we are going to have trouble over a long period of time. The trouble is not next week or next month. But to this, if the uh, glo global warming takes place slowly but surely, the temperature is increasing and the temperature anomaly is correct as reported by Charles Keeling, carbon dioxide and Mauna Loa, Hawaii, 
If that were to be true, then you can say that we are in trouble. Man will come out with some solution, that is a different matter, okay. But right now this, it is a cause for concern, all right. Now, let us go back to the, why is the residence, ah, is everybody through with this problem? 6.95, la, la, last bench, is it fine? 6.95 meters, okay. Why do you think we have a very short residence time of the atmosphere? This one, right? Can you tell me some reason? Anybody? Solar is, no, no, what is it? For atmosphere, what is it? What could be the reason? Residence time is mass of the reservoir divided by efflux. What is the mass of the reservoir? Mass of the reservoir. So, if you want to have low residence time, you are, you either have low flux or you have high efflux or low mass of the reservoir. The mass of the reservoir is reasonably low. We will remove that. The efflux seems to be very high for the atmosphere. Why? Uh, continuous interaction, large uh, exchange rate because of winds and other things. So, process, atmospheric processes are very fast compared to the processes in the mantle, okay. And uh, there is a large latent heat of vaporization of water. Because of this, generally the atmospheric time scales are very less, okay. So, therefore, um, the atmosphere is a very efficient component of the earth's surface in transferring the energy and water from the earth's surface to the atmosphere, right? Are you getting the point? So, the atmospheric, sorry, the atmospheric branch of the hydrological cycle is very efficient because it can do things very quickly. So, in your uh, hydrological cycle, this uh, complex interplay of various things in the hydrological cycle, the atmosphere plays a very important role because processes, processes are very quick in the atmosphere. Is it okay? Next, we will have to go to Next two classes, let us do some uh, little bit of math in hydrology, okay. Let us say that the globally averaged precipitation centimeter per centimeter per year or millimeter per month or something is globally average. And E bar is the globally averaged evaporation. What can you say about the two? On an average, if you are sufficiently average, P P equal to E, very good, that is our first equation. At a global scale, precipitation is equal to evaporation. If this were not to be the same, some lot of changes would have taken place, which would have been noticed by several scientists, which would have caused some other changes. So, they, we have proved that uh, it is clear that the, those changes are not taking place. Therefore, uh, <coughs> There is no appreciable imbalance. There is no appreciable imbalance between the globally average precipitation and the globally average evaporation. However, when you analyze the hydrological balance for a limited region, P is not equal to E. Now, you are able to understand what I am, the subtle difference.
if p is not equal to e, two possibilities are there. Possibility one, p is greater than e. Where? That is precipitation is more than evaporation or significantly more. You can always put it as p is much much greater than e, whatever. Ah. Rain for it. So, give some mathematical condition. So, within within plus or minus seven degrees latitude, it has been seen, it has been experimentally measured and confirmed that precipitation is much much greater than this thing. This is your Amazon forest, Singapore, all those places in that region. Okay. So, this up to plus or minus 7 degrees is called intertropical convergence zone. Okay. Now, P is where? Huh? Deserts. If P is much, much uh, smaller than E over the desert, evaporation is very less. Sorry, precipitation is very less. Evaporation is very high. How oh, this uh, water vapor, where is it going? Is the question clear? Where is water vapor? Ah, now you are able to understand that is called RG. Okay. Lot of evaporation is taking place. These deserts are basically 10, 15, 20, 25 degrees, so whatever. If you Dubai or must be 20 degrees, Dubai. 15 to 20 degrees not Chennai is 10 degrees, Delhi is 30, eh? 29 degrees, Dubai must be 25, eh? I do not know, ah, more, eh? ah, around that only. Okay. So, um, as this uh, water evaporates and becomes water vapor, this water vapor is carried either to the intertropical convergence zone or it is taken to the mid latitudes, where it causes lot of rain in Europe and other places. So, it, it will go either to the mid latitudes or to the equator. So, there is heavy incoming solar radiation, lot of clear skies, heavy evaporation, but no rain. Okay. So, the water vapor carry to But generally in continents, it is seen that P is greater than E, which is very good for us. So, this is responsible. So, this P is greater than E is one of the primary reasons why there is sustenance of plant, animal and human life continents. So, all right. Over the continents, it is seen that the precipitation is more than the evaporation. Now, in the next class, in the next class, we will just take a column, we will just take an atmospheric column. Apart from P minus E, there is also a transport of water vapor which is coming by the winds. So, P, E and transport by wind must also come. And if P, E and transport by winds T are not in balance, there is a net change of water vapor in the reservoir. So, you will get an unsteady equation that will be the. So, that is an atmospheric unsteady equation. Okay. Now, if you apply the same to a reservoir of water like a reservoir in a lake or something, you will get the basic hydrology equation, which is unsteady hydro. Instead of uh, transport by 
instead of transport by winds, you will get transport, transport by percolation, okay? stream flows from tributaries, rivers. So, if you account for all this, then you will have incoming, outgoing, then there is evaporation, then you will do a, that is a basic hydrology model. So, in tomorrow's class, we will simple with two, three steps, we will derive the basic hydrology model, apply it to a lake and see if there is a rainfall on the lake, how the height of the, height of the lake will respond to changes in simple model. So, if you want to more, know more about it, you have to take some advanced hydrology course. How many of you are civil engineers? You must have done all this. It may be elementary to you, but for other people it will be new. So, we will just uh, attempt some simple constant, constant area lake. Sometimes the lake can be shaped like this, sometimes it can be like this. Depending on this, when there is a forcing, what is a forcing? Forcing in the form of rain, if it happens, then the lake will respond differently. That is a funda, how to design a reservoir. Okay? Our goal is only atmospheric science, but we will do little bit of hydrology also. We will dabble in hydrology, one or two classes. Then we will look at carbon cycle, oxygen cycle and get back to thermodynamics. Thank you.